to our church service this morning and to everybody in the house. We had a good welcome. Everybody's excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, we are grateful for each and every one of you that are here today. Those who are back for the first time, I see some faces I haven't seen in a while. Welcome home. We've missed you guys. It's so good to have you all back here again. Um, this morning, I want to share with you, I know it is Valentine's Day. And some people walked in here this morning um, not knowing that it's Valentine's Day. I think they might get in trouble when they get home. But um, before, before I chat about that, I just want to run through a couple of our announcements this morning. So we have birthdays this week. Um, today, actually, Valentine's babies, Antoinette Peters, yes, and Elijah Alberts. And on Wednesday, we have Thora Penn. On Friday, it's Carla Johannes and Riley McCarty. And on Saturday, the 20th of February, is Chloe McCarty, Christina Blake, and Janine Michael, who's in the house this morning. Very happy birthday to each and every one of you. And to you, Janine, may God bless and keep you. Uh, may God make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and grant you many, 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 many more happy years. As Tyron says, until the age of 120, may you get there. May the Lord bless and keep you. So we mentioned now it's Valentine's Day today. Um, my husband and I have never really been big celebrators of Valentine's Day as such because we believe that you should show love towards one another every single day. And Valentine's Day, as we know, um, it has become very uh, a consumerism kind of thing, money-making thing. But it's good to celebrate love. It's good to show love towards those that you really care for. Um, the one thing that I've learned throughout these years is love doesn't cost you money. So you cannot buy someone's love. Giving a gift to someone now, um, the novelty wears off. But true love is something that you give every day and that you give freely True love is something that will cost you something, not in money, but in actually giving of yourself. And it's not something we do once a year on the 14th of February, but it's something that we need to do every single day of our lives. And, and I want to share with you 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 to 7. I know we know this passage very well. I mean, this is a passage that Wally and I had um, on our wedding day, and this is something that we remember as well. And it's a passage of love. It says, and now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. And then on this day, also, we received the greatest gift, and, and I think Valentine's Day, we should be reminded of that. In John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is the greatest love of all. So today, when you leave here, show love to those closest to you. Do those little things that make them feel special, but not just today, every single day. And then the greatest of all of that is remember the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the greatest love that we'll ever experience. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this reminder today of love, of the greatest love of all, how you gave your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. The greatest sacrificial love we will ever experience in our lives. And Father, this morning, I pray that we would know how special each and every one of us are, that you did that, that you gave your son 
not just for one person, but for the world, for each and every one of us. Your heart's desire is for all of us to come to know you, to have a relationship with you, and to live our lives with you. So Father God, I pray today that as we think on love, that we will think of you. And those who don't know you, that they might want to know you, that, that they would search and yearn for you, Father God, and that they too might experience the love that we share with you. So Lord, for those who are having birthdays, for those who are having anniversaries, I pray that you will bless them, that you will keep them. And Father God, that they might walk this year with you, not on their own strength, not on their own accord, but they would search for you. And Father God, that they would have that relationship with you, that you may guide each and every step that they take throughout this year. Bless us as a congregation here today, those who are at home. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be evident in this place and in every home, and that you would take control today, whatever it is that are in our hearts that you need to cleanse or that you need to speak to us about. I pray that you would take this time now and that we would avail ourselves, Father God, to hear from you this morning. Bless the service. May you be glorified in everything that we do today as we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
South Africa at the moment, especially from parents, because school starts tomorrow. Amen. This is a huge sigh of relief. I had parents messaging me throughout the week, when is school starting? What time? I probably told them the same thing uh, two weeks in a row. But, you know, with all of this happening, a friend of mine messaged me in the week. He said, because of 2020, he no longer wants God to just give him his daily bread. He wants the whole loaf, <laughs> not just his daily bread. But I'm reminded this morning that we can bring our requests to God this morning. We can bring our lives to God this morning. I think it's in the book of James that says, you, ask, you do not ask from God, that's why you do not receive. But when you do ask, it's because your motives are off. And so this morning, I want to ask God for more of His presence, more of Him, to experience more of Him in our lives. Again, anxiety and all of these things are so real. Uh, at our school this week, we suffered loss or oh, we lost our, uh, the, the guy who does our maintenance of the school, who runs that side of the school. And it was such a shock on Monday morning to enter work. And they call this emergency meeting. And that's the last thing you expect to hear, is that we've lost someone close to us and dear to us. And so it's so real this morning. Whenever you're getting a phone call, it builds up. Messages, if you haven't read the whole message, it builds up. And so God says in, in Philippians, you, ought, you don't have to be anxious in anything. But with thanksgiving, you can make your requests known to God this morning. And the peace that surpasses all understanding will reign on you and your life. And so I pray for peace. I pray for God's presence and for a knowing of our God during this season. Because COVID is going to be with us for some time. But God is with us forevermore. Amen. So we trust in God this morning and not in news and any of the things that is going around. In Jesus' name.
to hear you say that I'm your friend. And you are my desire. And no one else will do. Because nothing else could take your place. To feel the one. find the way to bring me back to you
This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me, and I, and I. This is the air I breathe. And this is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. And this is my day. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And I, and I'm desperate for you. so grateful for these opportunities. I pray, Lord God, that we will never be those who neglect these meetings. 
Lord God, for us in this place, Lord God, that you meet us. It's in the community of believers, Lord God, that you strengthen us, Lord God. People will know that we belong to you, Lord God, by the love that we have for one another. I pray this morning, Lord God, that we would love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that we would love each other, Lord God, as we love ourselves. These two, Lord God, are the greatest commandments. And all of the law and the prophets hang on these two verses. For when I love, I will not covet. For when I love, I will not kill. For when I love, I will not steal. Mm. But as Bernie quoted, Lord God, Corinthians uh, chapter 13, Lord God, it speaks about what true love is. Love never fails. Mm. The love that you pour out on us never fails. There's nothing this morning that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We are so grateful this morning, Lord God, that your presence is here. Where two or three are gathered, there you are, Lord God. Mm. Pray this morning that hearts would be open to receive from you. We pray, Lord God, your word, Lord God, would be our daily bread. And that your word this morning would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Lord God, we find ourselves in dark times. I pray that we would be Bible-based believers, those who build our lives on the foundation that is your word, but not just listening and hearers, but doers. For Jesus teaches that when we hear the word of God and we do it, our foundation is strong. For the winds will blow and the storms will rise, but we will not be shaken for our foundation is sure for it is in the word of the Lord. Pray this morning, Lord God, that as our pastor speaks, that he would be a mouthpiece, that you would use him mightily this morning, Lord God, to speak, thus saith the Lord. Lord God, as a vessel, that you would use him, Lord God, for your glory. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen and amen. You may be seated. Those online can finally hear me. But uh, yes, it's been good to worship together. It's good seeing some visitors here this morning as well in the corner. Thanks for joining us, your family. God bless you. Um, And yes, it's been good to be back in the house of the Lord. The last couple of weeks have been trying, I suppose, as the worship team myself. We've been um, on our own in the the church, uh, worshiping and just praising God. It's always nice to see people responding to worship and even responding to the word as it is spoken. And so I'm glad to have you all back in house. Um, I know those online, you're getting the message a little bit late this morning due to some technical issues, but you're getting it. Um, and yes, we are continuing, continuing on my series in Romans. Romans chapter 10, verse 16 to 21. And we'll look at man's treatment of the gospel. What have we done with the gospel message? Um, Looking back at the the original hearers, and even as you see, if you read this passage, there's a lot of quotations being taken out of the Old Testament. There's quotations from Isaiah and also Moses himself speaking. And so you'll see um, Paul is quoting these responses to his questions that he's asking. And obviously, the Word of God is alive even now, and so we need to apply that to our lives as we ask those questions of ourselves and our relationship with God. You see, the gospel is sent to all, but not all obey. It is true, and this complaint is as old as Isaiah's time, where he asked, who has believed our message? Now, this failure did not stop Isaiah's utterance. The the fact that people didn't listen, the fact that people didn't obey, didn't stop Isaiah from uttering the word of the Lord. Nor is the same experience any excuse against the proclamation of God's word in the here and now. You might say it's already tough enough to go and share the gospel message, but what do we do when we are rejected? The same thing Isaiah did. 
The same thing Moses did. The same thing Paul did. Continue. Continue to share the message. Some will hear. Some will receive. Some will accept. Some will transform their hearts and lives. And it will be evident in their lives. Now the reality is not everyone is going to accept the message we share. Not everyone is going to want to take that step. And this is not because of any fault on our side. Sometimes we might think, I'm not a great orator. I'm not um, very eloquent. I don't know all the scripture verses. Tyron can quote verse after verse after verse, but I might not be able to have that gift. I'm trying, I'm memorizing in this, but I don't have that gift. And you might come up with excuse after excuse, but the reality is that there is no excuse. As I said last week in scripture, I just can't remember where I found it or where it is written, but it says, I don't care. It's somewhere there. You go look for it yourself. <laughs> but it says that every single one of us has been given the task to go and talk about Jesus. No excuse. You see, often it is because of them hardening their hearts. Often it is because they might not think that they need this God. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But we've heard it said, I think it was last week or the week before, Christ came unto his own, but his own would not accept him. They were crying out, the Israelites were crying out for a Savior. We need a Savior. We want a Savior to come. And when he came, they didn't want him. No, that doesn't fit our design. That's not what we want exactly. Romans 10, verse 16 to 21, before I get carried away. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ, the word about Christ. But I asked, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Again, another quotation from Old Testament. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. May God bless the reading of his word to us this morning. Martin Luther in his commentary on Romans says this about these verses. Verse 16 confirms the word. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? He says, faith comes by hearing. This means that unless they hear, they cannot believe. The verse also confirms this statement from last week. How shall they hear without a preacher? Hearing indeed comes only through the word of Christ, he says. And lastly, the verse confirms the statement, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. The apostle here emphasizes the fact that he is speaking of a word which no one can comprehend. It can only be understood only by hearing it in true faith. You see, otherwise it's just another book that we read. But as we read the word of God with faith in our hearts, we, become, we begin to understand what God is trying to speak to us. My first point is this. Have you heard? Oh, sorry. You have heard, but have you listened? You have heard, but have you listened? It is the most frustrating thing, having a conversation with a person. And they so, simply don't get what you are trying to explain to them. They don't get what you are saying. You're saying all the right words, but they don't get it. More often than not, it is because they are hearing and not listening. (coughs) 
I mean, not to get into trouble, it is Valentine's Day. <laughs> Let me put it on the woman's perspective so I won't get in trouble. Woman, how often times do you speak and your husbands just don't get you? Men, I'm meaning it the other way around, but I don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> I've just been busy with um, premarital counseling with a couple that I'll be marrying at the end of the month. And something stood out in the sessions about conflict specifically. And two things need to happen when we reach a point of conflict in relationships. Firstly, I need to tell the story so that the hearer can understand it correctly. Do you get that? How many times have you spoken something, but you're speaking out of frustration, and the person isn't really getting the heart of what you're trying to say? The second thing is, the hearer needs to listen with a purpose to understand. So the speaker must speak with the purpose for the hearer to understand, and the hearer must listen with a purpose to be understood or to understand. You see, the second part is what Paul says is really what the issue is. And this is what frustrated Isaiah as well. Here's the thing. The message was clearly spoken to the Israelites. The message was clearly spoken. Jesus in himself spoke the, oh, he spoke in the gospel accounts of himself, spoke with Jewish leaders of the day. And I mean, if they don't listen to the one who speaks of himself with great insight and clarity, then we realize no matter how clear the message is, they are not going to hear the message. They don't want to hear the message. They will hear it, but they don't want to listen. Verse 18 says, but I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. But again he asks a great follow-up question in verse 19. But did they not understand? And it is very clear in the end of verse 21 um, that they understood, but they were a disobedient and obstinate people. Obstinate Look for a synonym, I said it right for the first time, synonym for obstinate is pig-headed. They were a disobedient and pig-headed people. They did not want to hear. Now listen, I think many of us were guilty of this. I know I was. I heard the message being spoken over and over again. I grew up in a household where the message wasn't just spoken, but it was lived for me to see, for me to learn. Yet I hardened my heart to these messages. And for various reasons. You might call it rebelliousness. You might call it stubbornness. You might just call it pig-headedness, which I think is exactly what it was. But I was just like that final words in verse 21. Disobedient and obstinate. Exactly. And I think many of us were that very same people. And this brings me to that second point this morning. And that is the difference between hearing and obeying. Hearing and obeying. We've heard from, from James when he talked about faith and works, faith and actions, and how they need to work hand in hand. And hearing and obeying is very similar Sometimes we hear a word being spoken over and over again. Your mother might speak it to you. Your father might speak it. Your pastor might speak it to you. And you hear it over and over again. And you, you think to yourself, wow, that is good. Wow, I should implement that in my life. And we walk out, get in our car, and forget about it. There is no obedience that follows up from that message. And the fact that Paul cries out, did they not all obey Sorry, the fact that Paul cries out that they did not all obey implies that some did. Not all of them were disobedient. Some were obedient. And wherever the gospel is preached, some will receive the truth in love. 
Some will receive the truth of this message in love of it. But there are many who, though they hear it, do not pay attention to it. And that is the sad thing. And here's the very sad reality, and allow me to tell it in a parable form this morning. A crowd of people in a very difficult time were hungry, were cold, were gathering together in a city center. And as they were standing there together, shivering on this cold winter's morning, a man walks by and he says, didn't you know that just down the road, there is a family serving homemade soup and bread. And it's fresh, it's good, it will nourish you. But even better, just across the street is a man handing out blankets for free. There's nothing expected. Just go and tell them of your need. They're handing out food and they're giving you blankets to all who is cold. As they heard this news, they immediately turned in the direction of the home and went to seek these families. And this one little boy, as he was walking, was saying, ha, 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 staying alive. He wasn't, he wasn't. It's my own story, I can say what I want. But a wealthy lady, as she stepped out of a boutique, a beautiful, exclusive boutique jewelry store, she steps out and she sees this commotion. And she also wants to hear what's happening. And she hears that somebody is giving out food, warm food, good food and warm blankets and she thinks to herself but i don't need that my cupboards are full i've got plenty of blankets in fact i've got so many blankets i could have given them blankets and she turned around and walked the other way you see there are people who when they hear the word being spoken will immediately realize they, they need and respond. They realize that this word is good for me. I need this word. I'm going to take this word and immediately live by this word. But in the same breath, there are people who don't even realize how desperately they need this word. They don't realize how desperate they themselves are in need of this word. They think that they have everything they need until a storm comes and takes it all away. I think many a person has realized they need when something desperate has happened in their lives. Both the poor, cold, hungry people and the wealthy lady heard the very same message however only those who realized their need responded in the correct manner you see we need jesus whether we think we might have everything we need the reality is we need jesus We still need him. You see, the importance of hearing and obeying is vital for the life of a believer. I said last week that if there's no fruit, if there's no action showing or displaying what's happening in my heart, then it's dead. Then we need to ask ourselves the question, have I really and truly accepted Christ as my personal Savior? Because His Word makes it clear, if I've called upon the name of the Lord, I am saved. But something must happen. There is a change. There is a transformation. I've told you the story so many times of one of my best buddies at school. One of the first people that I phoned and said, you won't believe what I'm doing now. And he was in England at the time, and he picked up the phone and he said, you're joking. You're joking. My mom was close by, I think she told him, nee, it is war, it is war. I said, Pastor, it can't be. You're fooling me. Said, Go check the website. <laughs> you see, something has to change 
The old self needs to be lived just there, in the old story. You see, it's still a part of my story, because I use that story as an example to tell people, but look at where I was. But look at where I am now. Look at what God has done in my life. I'm still not perfect. I still don't have all the things I desire and want, but I've got Jesus. And I'm happy. I'm satisfied. You see, it is so important for us to hear the word of God, but even more so to obey the word of God. Now lastly, let me urge you to obey. Spurgeon says, you have heard the tidings. You cannot doubt that it is glad tidings. Procrastinate no longer. Accept the joyful tidings and the Savior of whom the tidings speak. Why do so many remain disobedient to this heavenly vision, he says? Either they do not realize their need or else they do not recognize the richness of the supply. It must be one or the other. Either people who don't obey or don't want to, to call on the name of the Lord or don't think they need to call on the name of the Lord, either they, don't, they feel they don't need the message or they don't really know who God is, the supplier of all things. They don't think that He's able to do what He says He can do. They don't believe that He's able to save them because of where they find themselves. But let me tell you, if Jesus could save me, then He could save you. Now, my story might not be one of great doom, and if I didn't turn immediately, I was going to die on the spot. But the reality is, I was a sinner. And it doesn't matter what kind the sin is, sin is sin. And we need a Savior from that sin. Here's the thing. No one who has heard the message of Christ can turn around and say, but I didn't know. Or nobody told me. There's a story that I read recently of a family that didn't believe in Christ. Didn't believe in Christ. They've never heard the word. It was just, it was not a, a thing. They just lived life. They never thought about God, never thought about Jesus. And this young boy became ill. And on his deathbed, a missionary happened to pass by, knocked on the door, and the family was so in, in desperation, said, I don't know what this all is, but please, if you believe, come and pray for our son. The missionary speaks to the boy. The missionary tells him about Jesus. The missionary leads him to Jesus. And on his deathbed, his last words were, but I didn't know. But now I do. Please don't leave without telling my family because they need to know. And as he said that, he died. You have heard this message. You on the camera, you have heard this message too. So you cannot say you didn't know. Those who would not believe the message of the gospel, even though they have heard it, are thereby left inexcusable. There is no excuse and I like this. This is also from Spurgeon. And he says this. They may thank only themselves for their own ruin to the end. Because at the very end, we can only blame ourselves. Verse 21 completes this passage describing God's goodness to them. And listen to this. This is beautiful. All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people 
Now, Matthew Henry, in his commentary on the whole Bible, breaks this verse down in two parts. And he says, he speaks about his offers, and he speaks about his patience making these offers. Firstly, he says in the offers, I have held out my hands, offering them life and salvation with the greatest sincerity and seriousness that can be, with all possible expressions of earnestness, he says. Stretching forth the hands is the gesture of those that require audience, according to Acts 26 verse 1, or a desire or to desire acceptance, as Proverbs, 12 verse 20, Proverbs 1 verse 24 says. Remember how Christ was crucified with his hands stretched out. Stretched forth my hands as in offering reconciliation. And this passage says, all day long I've stretched out my hands, offering this reconciliation, offering this forgiveness, offering to have an audience with him so that they can speak, offering acceptance. And the second part he says is his patience in making these offers. And that we find in those words, all day long long the patience of god towards provoking sinners is admirable he waits to be gracious the time of god's patience is here called a day and much can be done in a day but the reality is that night comes much can be done in a day but a day also has limits as night falls, day comes to an end. You see, he bears long, but he will not bear forever. A time will come when time is up. For some of us, it might be sooner than others. But everybody will come to that place in their lives where their time is up. See, if I summarize this passage, starting from the end of last week, starting from verse 13, we, the followers of Christ, have a responsibility to listen to God's word. We have a responsibility to obey God's word. And lastly, we have a responsibility to share God's word. And we need to realize that as we do so, not everybody is going to listen. Not everybody is going to respond to God's word. Some are going to hear it. Some are going to accept it. And some are going to live it. Yet there's going to be others who completely reject it. However, we need to continue. We have to continue as believers. We have to continue the good work of sharing. We have to continue the good work of showing and loving, no matter how difficult it might be. Those who have heard the message this morning, you have a choice. And the choice is only yours. I cannot make that for you. Your mother and your father cannot make that for you. You need to make that choice. Either I'm going to accept this message or I'm going to reject this message. And you're going to have to live with that decision and die with that decision. You might be like that lady and you might feel that you don't need that salvation. I have everything I need. My cupboards are full. My family is healthy. I've got plenty of cars, homes, good schooling and all of those things. Why would I need salvation? I don't need to add any more complications to my life. And that is actually something that I've heard said to me when I've shared the gospel message. Life is complicated enough. Why would I still add a bunch of rules and regulations that I have to follow? If you truly believe that, my friend, 
I feel very sorry for you. Because you really don't know what you are rejecting. In fact, you really don't know who you are rejecting. And you really don't know what you're missing. Many of you have lost a lot of things during this pandemic. And a big one has been your peace. You face this pandemic with anxiety clouding your every decision, your every thought. And let me tell you, sometimes even as believers, we might become weary. Yet we still always have this hope that God is there. My opening sermon for the year, a couple of weeks, was almost my personal confession of how hopeless I felt when the president made that speech just after Christmas. But God quickly restored me and reminded me that He is my portion. He is my hope. He is my joy. He is my peace. Yet if you're not a believer, you cannot run to that because you cannot run to something that you don't have. We have a peace. We have a hope. Those who are on the WhatsApp group, you will know that we sent out a message in the week. Devon sent me a message. I think it was on Thursday. Yes, Thursday. And I hadn't finished reading the message when Auntie Pichu phoned me. And the two of that immediately set my heart off rhythm. I thought something big is wrong. The same message, the same phone call happening at the same time. Something is happening. And on TP2 phone, she says, I've just come out of training and I could hear in her voice something is wrong. Stephen was taken up to hospital. He has lost so much blood. He needed four pints. I heard now he's already had nine pints of blood since then. The first thing the doctor says, it could be blood cancer. And of course, our minds all run, don't they? But shortly after that, we get a message that's been cleared. I send a message to the church, please, please pray. He's been cleared from cancer, but we still don't know what the problem is. We get a message again yesterday that was sent. Praise God. Praise God. Yes, he's lost a lot of blood. And yes, he was in a very, very dangerous, dangerous place because he's Hemoglobin, I think, yes, was extremely low. And Peter said this morning that the doctor said, if you were 50 years old, you would have been dead. But praise God, you can thank God that you are 30-something and a strong young man because if your hemoglobin is so low, your body cannot cope. Did we face a moment of anxiety? Yes. Did we face a moment of despair? Yes. Do we face a moment where we felt a little hopeless? God, why is this happening? What can we do again? He's in hospital. Can't get to him. Can't do all these things. COVID regulations and all of these things run through our mind. But immediately we take a step back and realize God's got this. God's got this. We still get emotional, but now it's a different sense of emotion. Now it's a sense of emotion because we say, thank you, God, for what you have done. But you see, if, you don't, if you're not a believer, who do you run to in time of need? If you don't have God, who do you run to in time of crisis? I'm not saying that the life of a believer is going to be perfect and, and, and always going to be sunshine and roses and, and all of those good things we like to have. But here we've seen as a perfect example that even when we find ourselves in such, such situations, we can run to God. We can run to our fellow believers who will run with us to God. Together we will stand strong. Together we will pray. Together we will believe and God will come through. And what happened? God came through. 
My friend, I want to tell you this morning that you need to turn to Christ. You need Him, even if you don't realize it yet. And that leads us to the communion table this morning. I trust that everyone in the house has been served with communion. And those at home, you can have a moment to prepare yourselves. But the blessing is this. That as we approach the communion table, as we approach the story of Jesus, as we approach that image on the cross where Christ's hand were extended for us, His arms were open in reconciliation. For God so loved the world, as Bernie said this morning, that whoever believes in Him, whoever will accept these open arms, will not perish, but have eternal life. You see, those arms are waiting for you. Those arms are waiting for you. I told Auntie Mercia this morning, these arms are waiting for you for a hug. We're not allowed to give it yet. But just imagine those arms of Jesus, our Savior, Open for us that all who would call on the name of the Lord will be forgiven, will be wrapped in those arms of love, will be restored, be reconciled, be made new, so that we can have what we call now a history. That's a part of my past. That is who I was. That is what I'm turning my back onto now. And from this point onwards, I'm walking with Christ. To face whatever storm might come, He's walking with me. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, He held up the bread and He said, This is my body which is broken for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. I want to ask us before we partake together, that we'd first take a moment and just speak to God. Maybe there's something that you need to confess before your Savior this morning. Maybe you need to call on His name for the first time this morning. And I want you to do that before we partake together. If you need to forgive someone, if you need to restore a relationship, if you need to ask for forgiveness, do that now. Turn to God now. Commit now to go to your brother, your sister, whoever might have been offended or have offended you, and go and make right. Commit in your heart to do that even now. And then let us partake together. Let's just take a moment and we'll partake as one. Thank you, Lord. Let's partake. In the same way after supper, Jesus held up the cup and said, This is my blood, which is poured out for you. Take it and drink it in remembrance of me. Because as we eat and drink of this bread and of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together.
I want to ask my mom this morning if you won't just pray a blessing over us as we have received not just the, the bread and the cup, but also this word that God had given us. Won't you please use the mic so that we can hear it online. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this powerful word that came as a reminder this morning that Jesus loves us. This I know, mm. for the Bible tells me so. Dear Heavenly Father, won't you help us to hear, but also to listen. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Lord, our hearts yearn after you this morning that you would come and meet with us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Mm. For surely, Lord, we are nothing without Jesus. Lord God, we praise you and we bless you. We ask, Lord, that you will bless every believer in this house this morning. Those who are watching and listening with us, Lord, won't you draw them close to your Father heart. May we never forget that God sent his Son so that we could have life. Mm. Dear Father, we worship you and praise you this morning. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Continue the great work that you've started in our hearts. May we never let go of what Jesus has done for us. Bless us now, Lord. Send us forth with a blessing, Lord. Bless the pastor of this house, Lord, him and his family, our worship team, and our members, our families, as we commit them to you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Church, let us stand together as we receive the benediction and then we will sing our closing chorus together. Unfortunately, we're not allowed to, to fellowship at the back around coffee and tea just yet, but hopefully that will change soon. Um, but I trust that you would take the blessing with you and fellowship with your family at home. Philippians 4 verse 7 says this, The peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. Let's sing our closing chorus together. Hello, Benedict Thomas here, live from Autry Baptist Church. We're so glad that you could join us today. I would like to make you aware of online resources available to you from our church. Like and follow our Facebook page, Autry Baptist, where you will receive daily devotionals, weekly Sunday school lessons for preschoolers and teenagers, and where you can join us for our weekly live Sunday services. Feel free to share this page with your family and your friends. We would really love to hear from you. So if you would like to contact us, you can do so via our website, www.autrybaptist.co.za, our email, or our contact number displayed on the screen. Thank you once again for joining us. And join us and our worship team now as we sing our closing song.